good evening everybody and welcome to the third distinguished lecture of carwan today i am delighted and honored to have professor rajmohan gandhi sir with us we began the lecture with the tune on sarod of gandhi ji's favorite bhajan vaishnav janato so today we have the grandson of mahatma gandhi ji and c rajagopalachari professor gandhi professor gandhi is a historian peace builder former member of parliament of the upper house of indian parliament and human rights activist he is the author of more than a dozen books professor gandhi is currently uh, a research professor at the, at the college of education at the university of illinois and he is also a scholar in residence at the iit gandhi nagar professor gandhi's latest book published in De december 2018 is modern south asia no, a no. history from the modern south india yeah sorry modern south india a history from the 17th century to our times other books by him include understanding the muslim mind which was published in 1987 gandhi the man his people and the empire in 2008 punjab a history of from aurangzeb to mount batten in 2013 patel a life in 1990 and the understanding understanding the founding fathers and inquiry into the beginning of the indian republic in 2016 in 2002 he received the sahitya academy award for his raja ji a life a biography of chakravarti raja gopalachari from 1990 to 1992 professor gandhi was a member of parliament rajya sabha and today he is going to talk about some forgotten realities of the partition story so without further ado i would like to hand over the stage to professor gandhi to begin with his lecture and after the lecture we will have a small con conversation with professor gandhi so those who are watching us live can send their comments and questions in the live uh, chat thank you sir and welcome to the session uh, thank you ishan thank you for those kind words i'm very happy to uh, join you in this series of uh, conversations i'm very happy also that i will be speaking to Uh, several people in different parts of india i'm sorry i cannot see uh, all of you but i hope that you can see me and you can hear me and i hope that what i will say will be of some interest now i i must first of all uh, express my uh, regret that uh, my knowledge of partition as it affected the eastern part of the subcontinent at the time and the bengal area uh, is very very limited my research has mostly uh, been uh, with the punjab area and this is a very serious shortcoming in my research and my study and for which i express my my regret um, so but i'm very i i'm i understand that quite a few of uh, those who might be participating in the conversation today uh, maybe from the eastern part uh, so but i want want them to know that i have this serious shortcoming uh, not because of lack of interest but because of lack of circumstances opportunities to make a reasonable study of what happened <clears throat> in the eastern part of the subcontinent <coughs> now i must mention that you you have referred to my book and i will try and show the cover of my book i don't know whether it will show up well in the uh, screen or not uh, but here it is uh punjab and i want all of you to just try and look at this map uh now those of my generation and mine is a receding generation a disappearing generation but when we were children and when we were young people this was the punjab that we were extremely familiar with this was the map that we grew up with so much of it today is in pakistan uh and the eastern half which uh, became part of india in 47 was then split into through into three there was himachal pradesh there was indian punjab and there was haryana but here in this map you will see the undivided punjab that existed uh, for a long time uh, until 1947 now i also want to mention this that to people like me when we were growing up 
places like Lahore, Karachi, Dhaka, Chittagong, Peshawar, Rawalpindi, Multan, all now either in Pakistan or in Bangladesh, were parts of India. Just as all of you are, whatever your feelings may be, your familiarity is aroused when you hear of Mumbai, Kolkata, Lucknow, Jaipur, Chandigarh, Bengaluru, Hyderabad, Chennai. In the same way, when we were growing up, Lahore, Karachi, Dhaka, Chittagong, Peshawar, where like these other places are today. So I want all of you to be aware that this was how we all grew up. Now, I'm going to speak about some forgotten realities of the partition story. So a huge and hugely painful reality is that we don't have any adequate list of the names of the people who were killed the women, the children, the men who were killed uh, throughout the subcontinent. Of course, in 47, the bulk of the killings were in Punjab. There were terrible killings in the Bengal area uh, in 71, 72, an unbelievably large scale. But in 47, there was great misery in the eastern half also. But the number of killings was very large in the Punjab area. So this is the hugely painful reality that we don't have a list of the names of those who were killed. Everybody speaks of the terrible calamity and the many consequences of partition, but we don't have any adequate list of the names of the people killed. Now, many of you are, I'm sure, familiar uh, with the Vietnam Wall in Washington, D.C. Uh, this is where on granite wall, several large sections of it, 60,000 names are inscribed, permanently available. And people can, with their fingers, feel the, the letters of the names. Every single name as is found. And there is space to add more names when more deaths are identified. More than 60,000. It is one of the most beautiful memorials in the whole world. But the, the great power of it is that the names of the people who were killed. Now, mind you, uh, this is a limited list. It is only the list of the Americans killed. It doesn't have the list of the Vietnamese killed. Nonetheless, for Americans, who are conscious, so many Americans lost their lives. This is a very poignant reminder of that, that tragic period. Uh, so that's one, one sad reality, uh, an, an overlooked reality that we don't really have the names of those who paid the price. Another important reality which we are not conscious of is that the vast majority of those who were killed were humble and poor people from the so-called lower classes. Uh, there were some, of course, there were some well-known names also who were killed. But most of the better off, most of the well-connected, they had contacts with the railways, with the police, with the army, they were able to get away. Thank God that several, several people got away, but it's important to know and to remember that the vast majority of those who were killed were the worst off, were the weak. Um, it's, and there is evidence that there's some well-off people in Lahore, Hindus uh, of Lahore, they even said that when they came to the side, that we didn't even see any killings on, in their particular uh, area. They hadn't even seen the killings. So petty employees, servants, shopkeepers, and those who had neither connections nor the resources to arrange for their departure, they bore the brunt. Another very important reality, which is also generally not realized, 
that many more people in Punjab protected fellow Punjabis than killed fellow Punjabis. Now, I won't go into the statistics of how many might have been killed. I know the figure of 1 million killed has been given. Some people give a larger figure. Some people give a smaller figure that half a million were killed on counting both sides. So whatever the figure, whether it was half a million, a million or more, it was an immense figure. But so many people protected their fellow Punjabis. Hindus and Sikhs protected Muslims. Muslims protected Hindus. And people were able to get away, some in reasonable ways and other in very rough ways. But many people survived. So this is also an overlooked reality that those who protected their fellows were larger in number than those who killed their fellows in 1947. Um, also, those who left uh, on either side, some of them, when they were interviewed later by people, made this point, that they remembered that in their village or in their locality before they left, they, were, they had some friends who protected them. And these friends told the mobs that were intent on on wicked violence, that we have sheltered these people. You have to kill us first before you kill them. In so many cases, this bravery was shown by Sikhs and Hindus, by Muslims, that these are the people we have protected. Kill us first before you kill them. So these also are among the memories that survivors have related and these memories have been recorded. Uh, there's another forgotten fact, that there was a great parity, equality in the numbers killed. So the Hindus and Sikhs who were killed in the western side of Punjab, the Muslims who were killed on the eastern side of Punjab, the numbers were about the same. And there was also a great symmetry sort of an equal and opposite kind of pattern. So, for example, Muslims left Amritsar station, which was littered with Muslim bodies. They arrived at Lahore station, not very far, where they walked on corpses of Hindus and Sikhs in order to get out. So in Amritsar, they were surrounded by Muslim bodies. When they arrived in Lahore, at the station, they were surrounded by Hindu and Sikh bodies. Traumatized Hindus, traumatized Sikhs, running to Lahore station to flee to the east, saw in Lahore the traumatized faces of survivors who had fled in the opposite direction, bereft of slain relatives. And this is very well known, this is not a forgotten factor, that the train railway train filled with dead bodies became the enduring symbol of 1947 in Punjab. Those who successfully escaped by train or lorry, bullock cart or in foot columns saw dead bodies and rivulets of blood first on their side of the border as they were walking and then again beyond the border on the other side. So one person, a man called Mukhtar Ahmad Khan, who had fled from his village in Hoshiarpur district end of August, when he arrived in Lahore, he saw that in Lahore, the whole of Anarkali and the shopping area on the Mall was burnt down and Hindu and Sikh bodies, dead bodies were lying all over. So now going back a bit, I've told you some very general things about what happened in 47, but my, in this book that I wrote, research I did on what led to the partition, what led to the carnage, it was a long story. It was, I, I began my story in 1707 when Aurangzeb died, the last of the so-called great Mughals. 
And that is when Mughal power was declining all across India. It also declined in Punjab. Uh, and then the Sikhs uh, filled the vacuum that was created. And then the British defeated the Sikhs. Um, and then 1857 was, of course, a big event. Uh, but it was a much bigger event in UP and Bihar than it was in Punjab. In Punjab, the 1857 movement did not really take off. Nonetheless, uh, post-1857, the British adopted some very interesting uh, goals and strategies. So I want you to have an idea of the policy that the British settled upon once the 1857 revolt was crushed by them. One was separate Christianity from British rule. Now, one factor in the 1857 revolt was that many Indian, including many Indian soldiers of the British controlled army, uh, thought that the openly or in a subtle manner, they were being Christianized. This was a factor, as, as many people know, in the revolt. So the British policy after 1857 is very clear. We will separate Christianity from British rule. Secondly, we will re recognize the sensitivities of India's chiefs and aristocrats. Now, many leaders of the revolt were chiefs and aristocrats in different parts of India. So they decided now we will be, we will respect the sensitivities of the Rajas, landlords, Zamindas, aristocrats. This was a very important element in British policy. That we will rule Punjab and the rest of India as a superior race. We will dismiss any notion of equality between rulers and subjects. The ruling race will be superior. It will not mix, mingle, have too many social contacts with the ruled. However, we will provide roads and railway lines, post and telegraph offices, canals, schools, hospitals, colleges, universities. This we will do. This was a, a carefully thought out policy. And in particular, we will cultivate the farmer. The large farmer, of course, the landlord, but also the small farmer. We will cultivate the farmer. This became an important element of the policy. And we will recruit new soldiers for the empire's armies from rural Punjab. And as many scholars will know, both in the First World War, Second World War, a very large percentage of the Indian army under the British was Punjabi, Sikh Punjabi, Muslim Punjabi, Hindu Jat Punjabi, uh, Dogra Punjabi. So we will recruit new soldiers for the armies from rural Punjab, but we will underscore the recruits' distinct religion and his caste and ensure that the soldiers of different castes and religions did not really get to know one another. This is a very important element of British military policy. And finally, that we will make the soldier, the Indian soldier, the agent of the empire in his village. Now, slowly and steadily, a small English educated middle class began to emerge, entering government services, professions like teaching, medicine, law. In the bureaucracy, which remained white at the senior levels for a very long time, but also in the professions and in lower levels of the bureaucracy, sections of Punjab's Hindus, chiefly Khatris, Aroras, Brahmins, Daniyas, advanced far more rapidly than the more numerous Muslims. Now, it's important to recognize that if you took undivided Punjab as a whole, the Muslims were 53, 54, 55 percent, and Hindus and Sikhs were the rest. So the Muslims were a majority in the whole of Punjab, and they were a predominant majority in the Western Punjab. In the Eastern Punjab, if the Hindus and Sikhs were counted together, in much of Eastern Punjab, they were a clear majority over the Muslims there. So one important point to recognize is, and this is a, one of the forgotten points, that in education, Punjab's Muslims showed meager progress. 
So in 1911 and 12, there was a big census in 1911. Uh, Muslims were 53% in the province as a whole, but only 24% in the colleges. And even the, in the schools, only 24%. So you can see a very great contrast between the Muslim population and the Muslim percentage in colleges and schools. Uh, now, between 1919 and 1921, early 22, this three-year period, this was an amazing period. Uh, when for three years, Hindus, Muslims and Sikhs in Punjab came together. Now, many of you know of the, or everyone knows of the Jallianwala Bag massacre of April 13, 1919. What people don't know or have forgotten is why was the uh, this uh, awakening? Why were there rallies in Punjab? Why did the massacre occur? What were they rallying for? Why was this large crowd in Amritsar gathered? Crowd of Hindus and Muslims and Sikhs also, but mostly Hindus and Muslims. They had gathered in April of 1919 because they were all protesting against something called the Rowlett Act. The Rowlett Act uh, was being introduced by the British to curb freedom of speech, writings in newspapers, even uh, printing some pamphlets, which the British regarded as, as subversive, was a crime under the Rowlett Act. It was a very strong curb on freedom of expression in the name of security. And uh, Gandhi, who had returned to India in 1915 from South Africa, early in 1919, he decided that this was a, a very serious uh, attack on uh, freedom of expression. And so he, he wanted a nationwide satyagraha on the issue of the Rowlett Act and the suppression of speech. And there were two amazing leaders in Amritsar. There was an amazing Muslim leader, originally from Kashmir, called Dr. Saifuddin Kichlu. Uh, and then there was another doctor, Dr. Satyapal, who was a Hindu. These were two very popular leaders of Amritsar. And when they were organizing the Satyagraha against the Rowlett Act, the British deported these two. And these two had meanwhile requested Gandhi to come to Punjab to try and train them in Satyagraha. And the British government did not allow Gandhi to enter Punjab and he was put on a good train and sent back at the border to Bombay or Ahmedabad. So the deportation of Kichlu and Satyapal and the prevention of the entry into Punjab of Gandhi, these were, these were the issues which agitated the people of Amritsar, which is why they gathered in April of 1919. I don't want to give you the Jallianwala Bagh story, but I wanted you to know of the genesis of the Jallianwala Bagh demonstration, which then triggered the terrible massacre that we all know about. But from 1919 to 1922, when the non-cooperation movement was suspended, which saw amazing changes all across India. Now, the, the Hindu-Muslim unity that was shown in those three years did not continue uh, in a general sense in Punjab. Some people who had joined the movement remained absolutely committed to it. And Muslims, Hindus and Sikhs remained in solidarity with one another, but by and large, the solidarity, solidarity that was witnessed in those three years did not endure across Punjab as a whole. But it's important to note that what had happened in those three years was quite significant. And one man, a man called Afzal Iqbal, uh, he said this, he belonged to that area. That these events formed a psychological watershed in the development of modern India. For the first time, India witnessed a mass movement which shook the country and nearly paralyzed the British rule. 
for the first time in a rare manifestation of amity and accord, Hindus and Muslims drank from the same cup in that period, 1919 to 1922. Now, Lala Lashpat Rai was a great figure in Punjab. Um, he had many differences with Gandhi uh, in the years to follow. And also they worked together and sometimes they had differences. But this is Lala Lajpat Rai's statement. Quote, it is a fact that from 1919 to the end of 1921, Hindus and Muslims of India were fairly united. For the first, continues, for the first time in the history of India, for the first time in the history of India, a kafir preached from the pulpit of the biggest and historically the most magnificent mosque of Northern India. This is the Badshahi Mosque in Lahore, which Aurangzeb had built. So in the Badshahi Mosque, Hindus preached to Muslims in that period, 1919 to 1922. This is Lala Lajpat assessment. But we must recognize that the Jallianwala, the non-cooperation movement, the Khilafat movement, did not result in the creation of a very strong multi-religious political party in Punjab. The Congress was a largely Hindu party in Punjab. It was also a largely urban party. The Muslim League was a largely urban party. There were some Sikh parties with influence in the countryside. And there were various Muslim groups with influence in the countryside. Afterwards, another party called the Unionist Party emerged, which represented the large farmers, but also tried to represent and succeeded in trying to represent the small farmers. I will come to that a little later. Now, but the thing to know is to notice that despite this amazing three year period of cooperation, solidarity, that period did not endure. And Punjab entered a period where the Muslims, the Sikhs, the Hindus, each of them tried to create a good relationship with the British government and not, did not bother to create good relationships with one another. This was the great. A tragedy, you might say, of Punjab. Here I want you uh, to, to, to take note of, and those of you inclined to do further research, to focus on this very interesting man and the very interesting unionist party, which he was one of the founders of. His name is Fazli Hussain. Fazl-e-Hussain. 1877, he was born, he died in 1936. He was Cambridge educated. He also became a barrister in London. And he was a Muslim of the Bhatti Rajput caste. Now, many of us are familiar that in the Hindu society, there are many castes and many sects even. But it's important to note that among Muslims also, there are many biradaris, and apart from the Shia Sunni divide, which many people are aware of, Muslims in all parts of India, are also divided in other ways, sometimes by class, by profession, but also biradaris and caste. So in Punjab, the Rajputs were a distinct Muslim group. The Jats were another Muslim group. There were five or six other very significant Muslim groups. It's important to note, not to think of the Punjabi Muslims as one homogenous group. Now, Fazli Hussain, he played a very important part in 1916 uh, in the so-called Lucknow Pact between the Congress and the Muslim League. Now, this 1916 Lucknow Pact was largely initiated by three individuals, uh, Lokmanya Tilak, uh, Annie Besant, and Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Jinnah was in the Congress. He was also in the Muslim League. Uh, and so there was this pact that the Congress would agree uh, that there should be separate electorates for Muslims. 
Tilak agreed to this. Annie Besant, Congress leader, original of Irish, also said, yes, we will agree to this. So, so the, the, the Lucknow Pact was that there, there will be separate electorates and we will work together for self-government. Not independence was not mentioned, but self-government. And Fazli Hussain, this man from Punjab, he was a very important element in favor of this settlement. So after the Lucknow Pact, and then after the Chalyabala Bagh non-cooperation, and the great movement for independence, the British decided that they were going to favor a agriculturalist party of big landlords, but also of farmers, and try to, unite, to create a new political Indian force as against the Congress, which stood for independence or towards self-government. And uh, Fazli Hossein, who to begin with was willing to, in the first movement against the Rowlett Act, he took part and then he withdrew. And the British cultivated him and managed to build him up. And he had a very important Hindu ally, Sir Chotura. He was a judge lawyer from Rotak. There were many other very important figures in the Unionist Party, but Fazli Hussain and Chhoturam were among the main leaders. So now this was a pro-British party in some ways, in many ways. But important to note that it was a Hindu, Muslim, Sikh party. All three groups came together. And what was the issue that Fazli Hussain took up? First of all, yes, he was not himself, by the way, a big landlord. He was from the Rajput caste, elite caste, but he was not himself. He was a city man, not quite a big landlord. He was a lawyer. But he, he encouraged in the formation and strengthening of the Unionist Party. But his main uh, rallying cry was, there should be fair representation for Muslims in the schools and the colleges and the municipalities and government jobs in the Punjab. So uh, this is what he did, he did. Uh, Fazli Hussain. He said that there must be some kind of reservation uh, and the British supported him and the Unionist Party became uh, uh, more and more popular among the not only the farmers of Punjab, including some rich Hindu farmers, and many Sikh farmers, but also among the Muslims of the cities because of Fazli Hussein's demand for some kind of fair representation of Muslims in schools and colleges. Uh, now, many Hindus and Sikhs of Punjab, so they had felt that their success in schools and colleges, their entry in the professions, their places in government departments was because of their own hard work, their merit. And they strongly opposed the effort to have some kind of uh, reservation in schools and colleges in Punjab. Uh, now, Gandhi, who was uh, also, apart from other things, quite a, a wise and astute man, he could see what was happening. And he did not like the pro-imperialist character of the Unionist Party, but he knew that the Unionist Party had Hindus and Muslims and Sikhs. So he tried to encourage the Punjab Congress leaders to cultivate relations with the Unionist Party. In 1924, he went to Lahore, he met Fazli Hussain, he had a good meeting with Fazli Hussain. But the Hindu leaders of the Congress party in Punjab were very angry at Gandhi's attempt to cultivate relations with the Unionist party. And by this time also, in the years thereafter, in the late 20s, the early 30s, many others in the National Congress, including Jawaharlal Nehru. Jawaharlal Nehru was an ardent socialist, a strong opponent of landlords, rajas, maharajas. He didn't like the idea that there should be any conversation with the Unionist Party. So 
And so this is in a way the crux of what happened in Punjab. The failure of the nationalist movement to enlist uh, a group. Now this was a, a group which was willing to compromise to some extent with the British imperialists. But important point, there were Hindus and Muslims and Sikhs in the Unionist Party. So this is a very important forgotten part of the Punjab story. Uh, in 1926, the British who realized this Fazli Hussain is a very influential, important guy. So they made him a knight. He became Sir Fazli Hussain. He also became some kind of minister in Punjab. Uh, now there's something else which uh, some are aware of, but uh, many are not aware of. At the end of 1928, Jinnah, who by now had left the Congress, but he made a very interesting and uh, un very uh, unexpected proposal. At the end of 1928, Jinnah made this bid for some kind of nationalist unity between the Congress, the Muslim League and others. He said that, yes, in 1916, we uh, Congress had agreed on separate electorates. But Jinnah said, now I'm prepared to agree on joint electorates. I'm prepared to agree that, to persuade the Muslims to agree to joint electorates. If Hindus and Sikhs in Punjab and Hindus in Bengal would agree that in Punjab and in Bengal, which were Muslim majority provinces, very large Muslim majority provinces, if in Punjab and Bengal, the non-Muslims would agree that in the legislature of Punjab and the legislature of Bengal, Muslims would have a majority to reflect the population percentage. Then they let the, the Congress and the Muslim League can work together for India's independence. This was Jinnah's proposals in 1928, end of 28. So by this time, the Indian National Congress had appointed a group led by Motilal Nehru to form a constitution for the future. How provincial governments would function, how a central government would function, and whether on the question of separate electorates, reservation of seats, and so forth. They were preparing a plan, and the Jinnah's proposal was a kind of alternative plan. It was in some ways a reasonable plan. It was a bold plan. Giving up separate electorates, having joint electorates, was a, seemed a large concession on the part of the Muslim side. But he wanted Bengal and Punjab, undivided Bengal, undivided Punjab, to remain uh, to have assemblies with Muslims which have a majority through an arrangement of reservation of seats. Now, the Indian National Congress's leaders in Punjab were uh, Hindus mostly, some Sikhs, uh, but neither the Congress leaders in Punjab nor the Akalis and other Sikh groups in Punjab were willing to agree to this. They said, no, no, in Punjab, yes, we may be in a minority, but we are more educated. We have worked for generations. We have received education. Why should we allow uh, that there should be a Muslim majority in the legislature? No, we will never accept this. Sim there was a similar reaction in Bengal. Yes, Muslims are in a majority in the undivided Bengal, but we Hindus have for generations done so well in our studies. Um, and we, we, so we are entitled if circumstances uh, enable a Hindu majority in the legislature, why shouldn't that happen? So because of very fierce opposition from the leaders, Hindu leaders of Bengal and Hindu and Sikh leaders of Punjab, Jinnah's proposal at the end of 1928 was rejected. This was a very important moment in the story of, of the national movement. Uh, and now, interestingly enough, Lajpat Rai, who had previously been opposed to enabling a 
Muslim majority in the Punjab legislature. In fact, in 1924, Lajpat Rai had said that Punjab should be divided, that Eastern Punjab should become a separate province. Um, so he, he was, was very keen that the Hindus should have an area in Punjab where they could be dominant. But by 1928, Lajpat Rai was willing to agree, yes, for the sake of the All India progress of the freedom movement, we in Punjab may agree to let the Muslims have a majority in the legislature of Punjab to reflect the population of the undivided Punjab. But then in 1928, before this meeting took place in Kolkata and end of 1928, Lajpat Rai died, as, as we know. So of course, we don't know what might have happened in Lajpat Rai, but what's had remained alive. But the important thing is that Jinnah's interesting initiative uh, was rejected by the Congress and by other political parties and that deepened Jinnah's alienation from what might be called the national mainstream and eventually it led, of course, to Pakistan demand. And meanwhile, uh, in 1936, then, 1936, Fazli Hussein also died in Punjab. Jinnah had tried to build a relationship with Fazli Hussein, but Fazli Hussein said, no, no, in Punjab, we will run our own. The farmers of Punjab will run Punjab. You stay out. Jinnah, you stay out. He was, he was stood firm against, against Jinnah. Uh, and then the Unionist Party, first there was this man called Sikandar Hayat Khan, who became uh, chief minister, prime minister, it was called in Punjab in those days. Uh, he died in in the uh, 42, and he was followed by a very interesting man called Khizr, Khizr Hayat Khan. Khizr Hayat Khan was also sort of a Muslim Rajput from land-owning groups. And uh, but by this time, uh, things were changing. And you know what happened in March of 1940 in Lahore, uh, the so-called Pakistan resolution was passed by the Muslim League. The resolution was proposed by Fazlul Haq of uh, East Bengal. Um, but it, and the Pakistan name was not there in the 1940 March resolution. It came a little later, but it was a demand for sovereign, separate Muslim majority areas. It was not clear in that resolution whether there would be one Pakistan or two Pakistans one in the Northwest, one in the East, but wherever the Muslims were in a majority, they should be allowed to form their own independent states. Um, so this was a very big challenge to the Unionist Party in Punjab, and now uh, being led by this man called Khizr Hayat Khan. Um, and I won't go into all the details, but there were important elections in the winter of 45, 46 late 45, early 46. By this time, the war was over. Quit India movement had come and gone. Leaders had been imprisoned. They were out of prison. Subhash Bose had gone and formed the Indian National Army. Of course, by this time, he was killed also. People weren't sure that he was dead. But in uh, Punjab, in the elections of 45, 46, uh, the Muslim League had made headway. But still, uh, the Unionist Party and the Congress Party and the two or three Sikh parties together had more seats in the assembly than the Muslim League. So a ministry was formed in February, March of 46 led by Khazar Hayat. So now for the first time, after saying no, no, no to the unionists, the Congress were willing, uh, especially because of the Pakistan demand, that we will now work with the unionist party and the Sikh parties. And this ministry was formed. But the largest single party was the Muslim League. Khizr had relatively few seats. Congress had a decent number of seats, six had some seats. And there was a very large popular movement led by the Muslim League, some kind of satyagraha by the Muslim League, saying that the popular vote is for Muslim League, but 
this is a this is a coalition that is not a real one. There was a huge big, uh, and by, there was another uh, very important element at this stage, which is worth noting, that the British, who had cultivated the Unionist Party, in fact, who had helped create the Unionist Party, now the war is ending and the British soldiers don't want to remain in India. They've had enough. Uh, the British really want now to get out of India. But they are very unhappy that the Congress, which had opposed the British for such a long time, would inherit India's government. No, that was not an appealing idea for the British. The Congress is our enemy, and we will strengthen the chief enemy of the Congress, namely the Muslim League, led by Jinnah. And the Unionist Party, which has been very loyal to us, we will drop the Unionist Party. And Khazar Hayat Khan uh, was, uh, you might say, dropped abandoned by the British. I won't go into the details, but it's a very well-known story. In 1945, there was a conference. And the Congress said, we are willing to work with the Muslims. Uh, Wavell, the Viceroy was there. And that there can be a national, temporary national government. Uh, we can have uh, someone from, some from the Muslim League, we can have some from the Congress, and we can have some from non-Muslim League Muslim parties like the Unionist Party, Khizr Hayat Khan can be in the government, national government. And the British said, if Jinnah does not agree, we will not allow. And the talks collapsed. Khizr Hayat Khan was dropped. And uh, so as I say here, that um, Anyway, that uh, Kizer did not realize that when, when empires are retreating, uh, they don't remember who was loyal to us and they drop those who should be dropped and they think of what is in their interest and not what, who, who was loyal to them. Um, and after the big movement against the Kizer government, Khizar was called by extremist Muslims, he was called um, Sardar Khizar Singh. He's not Khizar Hayat Khan, he's Sardar Khizar Singh. This was the propaganda. And one day uh, his son told him, uh, Daddy, these my friends tell me that uh, you're not a Muslim, that I'm not a Muslim. So Khizar Hayat then surrendered, he resigned. This is early March of 47. And that is what led to violence, led to the Sikhs and the Hindus of Punjab wanting partition, led to the Congress agreeing first to the partition of Punjab, partition of Bengal, partition of India as a whole. There are many other aspects, but I will not go into the detail. But this is the story of Fazli Hussain and Khizr Hayat Khan to unionist leaders, they were not as keen on fighting the British, but they did have Hindu and Sikh partners and allies. Now, two other points before I conclude and before we have uh, questions and answers. One is about the Radcliffe Commission. Everybody writes about this, that this man, Cyril Radcliffe, came from England, never had been to India before. He drew a line in Eastern India. He drew a line in Western India. What did he know? This is true. Radcliffe did not know India much. He was a judge. And he drew lines according to what he thought was appropriate. But it's important to note, and this is what most Indian uh, scholars have forgotten or, or don't give importance to. Radcliffe 
was the chair of a commission. He was not the sole judge to decide the boundary. In Punjab, there were two Muslims and two non-Muslims, one a Sikh, one a Hindu, four other judges, plus Radcliffe. In Bengal, there were two Hindu judges, two Muslim judges, and Radcliffe. So it is because the Indian judges could not agree, neither in Bengal nor in Punjab. They could not agree on where the line should be. So it was left to Radcliffe to draw the line. In Punjab and Bengal, the Indian judges refused to agree on a fair dividing line. And so Radcliffe drew his line. Uh, we rightly criticize him. We make fun of the fact that this Englishman who knew nothing about India comes and draws a line and decides the future of millions of people. It looks so absurd and it is absurd. But let us remember that behind this possibility of one not su sufficiently knowledgeable Englishman drawing a line lay the inability of four Indian judges in Punjab, four Indian judges in Bengal to agree on a fair dividing line. My last point, I mentioned how British strategy was in Punjab, all of India, that the farmer should be, the soldier should become the agent of the empire in the village. And then so many Indian soldiers joined the First World War, Second World War, played a very large part in these wars. And the soldier was the great pride of, of the British rule. See, we have created this wonderful uh, institution on the subcontinent. But when 1947 arrived and violence took place, the soldier trained in discipline who had some weapons, who had prestige, was of absolutely no use. Not only did the Indian soldier fail in preventing the terrible carnage, in many cases, the Indian soldier took part in the carnage. By this time, the soldier was demobilized, the army at the end of the war, so the soldiers were sent home. But the Muslim soldier in Punjab, the Hindu soldier, the Sikh soldier, they all joined different camps. And in some cases, the terrible carnage, you know, when these trains were stopped and killed, in many cases, those who were guiding the massacres in the trains were demobilized soldiers, Muslims, Hindus, Sikhs. It is also true, uh, and it is a sad story, that some of the Indian National Army, Subhash Bose's uh, army, when they came back to Punjab, they also became not Indian soldiers, but Muslim soldiers or Hindu soldiers or Sikh soldiers. And they also took, in some cases, a prominent part in the unfortunate killings. So, uh, uh, so I'll just read this sentence, which is from my book. Seen during decades of strategic thinking, as the empire's agent in his village, nurtured into a relationship with his white officer, yet prevented from bonding with mates who spoke his own language, but belonged to a different religion. The Punjabi soldier who existed in hundreds of thousands suddenly seemed to be of no use when the empire's soon to be free colony faced its greatest challenge in a century. So this was the, the sad climax to the empire strategy. But the sadness is not connected only to the British role. It is connected to the role of really everybody who was involved in those amazing events in the 20s, 30s, and 40s of the last century. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much sir, for this very enlightening and very, uh, very lucid, I think, analysis of the partition story. While it was a very detailed one as well, sir. There are some questions I think uh, that I would like to ask you. The first one is, uh, in popular, I think, history, one read a lot about the partition that occurred in Punjab that you mentioned. Uh, but many forget that Bengal was also experiencing the same. Can you talk a, a little about the partition of Bengal? And there's also a question on the partition of Assam that was going on, that is somewhat missed in the popular narratives. Well, these are very important questions, of course, in the story of Bengal and how there was an attempt made <clears throat> for a united Bengal maybe even some kind of autonomous or even independent United Bengal. Uh, so that is a very important uh, part of the story and whether it could have been successful or not. Sarat Chandra Bose was a very leading figure, Subhash Bose's brother, in the attempt to make keep a United Bengal. And there were some important leaders of the Muslim parties also who were supportive of this. But it did seem to be the case that in 46, 47, the sentiment, uh, what, the, the division between the Hindus and Muslims had become very deep in different parts of, of Bengal. Um, and so, so, but yes, I, I mean, as I myself, I, you know, I wish that I could become younger, uh, uh, Ishan, and then write a story of uh, the Bengal partition. Sadly, I don't think that dream of mine will be realized, but. I hope somebody will really do it and include Assam, include the Northeast. Uh, it is true, you know, Assam had a province called Silhat, which then the agreement was it would become a district. And it, became, it was, it was kind of, there was a referendum and Silhat joined, decided to join Pakistan and uh, by everyone's agreement. And there was a strong anti-Bengali feeling among the Assamese. And Silet was a Bengali speaking area, as you know, in today also in today's Assam, there is a very important Bengali speaking area, very large area, very oh, lots of so uh, uh, the story of Silet, the story of Bangladesh. But you know, what is needed, I and let me say for young people who will may want to do some research in the future, that uh, it is, it is important when you say you look, want to study the story of Bengal, it is, as somebody mentioned, story of Assam should be studied at the same time. Story of the Nagas, the Mizos, the Khasis, the, they also should be studied. Uh, the, the Nepal story is also connected there. So somebody should write, you might say, a story of Eastern subcontinent, Eastern India. You can have any starting point. You can say from, from the British arrival. Uh, 16th century, 17th century, or whatever. In my Punjab story, I said Aurangzeb's death, but that is an arbitrary starting point. You can have any starting point, but there should be an integrated study of Eastern India. Integrated study. Yes, there is a very large Muslim element there. There's a Hindu element there, but there's also all the other tribal groups there. Then there is the connection of Orissa with Bengal, connection of Bihar with Bengal. And partition of Bengal of 47, but my goodness, what about the partition of Bengal in 1905 and the annulment of the partition in 1911? So the partition is a tremendous story in Eastern India, but it is a story that demands a lifetime of scholarship on the part of some gifted young scholars like you. Now, yes, okay, that's my comment on that one. For sure, sir, the, this, you know, this seems to be a very fascinating project and many of the younger lot of historians might work upon it in, in the coming future. Uh, sir, many people think that partition could be prevented. It, it's a popular narrative that uh, partition could be prevented in 1947. What is your take on it as a historian? You know, historians try to figure out what happened, why it happened, how it happened. Their main focus is not what should have happened or what could have happened. Those questions should be asked, but I think lessons can be learned. For instance, I, as I mentioned, could Congress have tried 
to have a more open policy towards the unionist party of Punjab. So this is not an academic question. In today or today's also, supposing we don't like some policies or some, some waves or some push of a particular kind, and others, many people are unhappy with a particular push. Then do we work together? Or do we say, ah, ah, but he doesn't agree with me on this, so I will not work with him? So the refusal to have any truck with the Unionist Party can be seen today in the refusal to have any truck with X, Y, or Z, even though we are all unhappy about certain trends. So from that angle, a study of history is, is very useful. But I think by and large, the, the thing to, why did partition happen? That partition happened because uh, the, in everybody's mind, the question was when the, when the British leave, who would rule India? Would all Indians rule India or would some Indians rule India and oppress other Indians? So was there a nucleus that could represent all of India? Now, in theory, at least, that was the attempt of the Indian National Congress, that the Indian National Congress was not a Muslim party, Hindu party, whatever. The attempt, the idea, yes, it was an elite party to begin with, and then it became a mass party, people's party, but still so many people felt excluded from it. So if we are to have any kind of national movement, if it can be an inclusive one, if uh, if we can get along with people of different kinds, uh, I think that is a question to ask. So uh, I think a narrative of the situation of women is also missing in the partition story. Very so true. can you talk about the situation of women? Well, this is, of course, the most uh, important question. I mean, I mean the the many wonderful uh, research has been done on this and uh, how uh, the cruelty and atrocities on women were seen as, uh, you might say, uh, the final proof of your conquest over somebody, some group, some race. And so, so many, uh, and again, this was, uh, people of different religions did this horrible atrocities, I mean, unspeakable atrocities and women were committed. I, so, uh, yes, so that is absolutely central to our understanding of, of, what, of what happened. Um, yeah, going back on, on, if I may, on the partition question, if I may, a bit, of course, everybody knows of this idea that Gandhi had that, you know, Jinnah might be made Prime Minister of United United India. It was a very practical idea. Yeah. And that, uh, but Mountbatten was strongly opposed to it. And Patel was very strongly opposed to it. Jawaharlal Nehru was strongly opposed to it. And so the idea was never put to Jinnah. But uh, Gandhi's idea was that, well, Jinnah is interested not just in the Muslims of Muslim majority areas, but he's also interested in the Muslims of rest of India. So maybe he might uh, agree and, and the Congress would be in a majority in the parliament so they would prevent Jinnah from doing anything really rash or extreme. But uh, that, but uh, an interesting thing, Gandhi wanted this idea and he was convinced that it could work. And many people agreed, uh, told Mountbatten, Maulana Azhar told Mountbatten, yes, yes, this can work. But Mountbatten was absolutely, I man apna plan bana liya hai, a man ja raho wapas. Koi mujhe archan nahi chahiye isme. Ye Gandhi wali ka plan nahi. Ab sab ho gaya ho gaya. And so it was not taken seriously. Uh, but who knows? But I, I, the lack of partnership and trust between different elements of the Indian population. Yes, and again, to repeat something that's very well known, uh, it is true, we have seen, even in today's story, you've seen how the British play divide and rule. 
But as Maulana Muhammad Ali of the Khilafat movement said, it is not true that they divide and rule. We divide and they rule. We divide and they rule. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, it might seem as a very basic question, but I would like to ask you, and this will be my final question, and then we'll open the floor for the audience questions. What was the consequence of the partition in 1947? And are we still suffering from those consequences in both the nations, Pakistan, India, and even Bangladesh for that matter? Yes. So, you know that uh, during the period of British rule and even before then, Hindus and Muslims had sometimes good relations, sometimes poor relations. Of course, Hindus were of different kinds, Muslims were of different kinds. But by and large, we can say that there were good relations during some periods, poor relations, there were good relations among some people, maybe among poorer people, there were better relations. But there never was any real fusion. Fusion. Um, and so, um, and yet so many people of all kinds said that we will create fusion, we will create bhaichara, Ishwara uh, you know, that we're all the same, children of the same soil, children of the same almighty, uh, we, will, we will work together somehow. But always, uh, you know, in democratic politics also, particularly in democratic politics, uh, to play a religious card, a caste card, becomes so useful. Ye hamare hain, wo paraye hain. Wo hamara nahi hain. Maha tum kaise ja sakte, usse tum kaise baat kar sakte. So this line becomes also successful sometimes in politics. So the notion that Hindus and Muslims were two nations. So when in 47, Gandhi even, Nehru Patel and everybody agreed that they should be partitioned. People of India agreed. People of Punjab agreed. People of Bengal agreed. Yes, there are most wanted United Bengal, but many and more Bengalis at that time said, no, no, we can't live under Muslim majority. Muslims can't live under Hindu majority. So where Muslim majority is, there is no way, but in the other places, we will make it. So, uh, this notion, but then when India accepted partition, India made this tremendous decision. That India has, does not accept the two nation theory. Pakistan may accept it. But in Hindustan, mein Hindu, Muslim, Sikh, Isai, we will be all in the same way. And we will be all in So this was a tremendous, and you know, in the poisonous atmosphere of 47, at that time, in that kind of passion and toxicity. Us vakht agar humare desh ke logon ne, netao ne, ye tay kiya, ki ye sab ka desh hai, sab ke haq hum bachayenge. It was an amazing achievement. I would say that greater than the achievement of independence was the achievement that, that India sab ka hai. So one of the worst consequences of partition was this notion the Muslim or Muslimano ka desh hai, ab ye hamara Hindu ka desh ho jayega. Lekin usse ham bach gaye, saath saal to bach gaye. Lekin ab, but that that notion is very very strong in recent years. It has gained tremendous strength. So yes, that all Indians are one was a notion that took a big knock when partition was accepted. So there's a question from Priyankar Day. Yes. His question is, in 1971, Ratcliffe said that he had no alternative rather than to divide because he could not do more rather than accepting it because Gandhiji did not accept it, but it was Nehru who pressurized for the division. So what is your take on this? Look, uh, it is true that Gandhi uh, was against the division, but it is true that in the end he accepted it. 
who were the biggest biggest uh, advocates for partition in 47 even more than nehru patel and and everybody raj gopalachari rajendra prasad govind vallabh pant shyama prasad mukherjee very strong advocate of partition at that time in bengal so um, you know there's why uh, people do speak of uh, the gandhi subhash bose clash of 39 and that why did gandhi push subhash bose out as a kajata but another question can be asked suppose suppose subhash bose had agreed in 39 uh, that not to run for the Congress presidency, and he'd stay down in India. Then in '47, agar Subhash Bose bhi hote, yaha, such a strong advocate of Hindu-Muslim partnership, to shayad partition hota kya hai? Nahi hota. We don't know. So, uh, what I'm trying to say is that Gandhi certainly was unhappy with partition. But Nehru, Patel, Patel particularly, but others also by this time said, Hum inke saath hamara nahi chalega. Jaha inki majority hai, wo chalayin. Yaha hum chalayin. So this was the, so to some extent, but so that is what happened in, that is what led to partition. But remember my point, Despite partition, the Indians decided that India was a nation for all. We will accept partition sadly, but we are not accepting the two nation theory. That Muslims, Hindus, mm. all castes, atheists, everybody can live with understanding, mutual accommodation, acceptance. That is, yeah. Uh, so this question is from Alkama Nasir. His question is, according to you, why there wasn't any proper planned procedure for migration by the government? And if there was, uh, please throw some light on it. Right. So, <clears throat> so it's very important. This is a very important question. So when the leaders of the Congress and other leaders uh, all agreed on partition, they did not agree that Pakistan was going to be a Muslim nation and India will be a Hindu nation. Jaha Muslim majority hai, they can form a separate nation. So that was all the agreement. The Indians never agreed on two nation theory or that India would be only a Hindu nation. So where was the question of migration? So, the, but in Punjab, when the rioting be, became very serious in March, April 47, and then during partition, in August, both governments agreed, India and Pakistan, that in Punjab, there will be some transfer of population. Jo Musliman East Punjab ke, wo sab Punjab West jayenge, Hindu or Sikh ke yaha jayenge. That was, but nobody agreed that Baki Musliman sab Pakistan jayenge. Or Vahaka Sari Hindu or Sikh Yang, as a Kisine, Kabi accept Nikiata, na Indian in a Jina accept Kia. Jina said, I'm going to protect the Hindus and Sikhs. He may not have succeeded, just as Indians didn't succeed in protecting the minorities. But Jina didn't say that Pakistan only belongs to Muslims. So the acceptance of Pakistan, partition in 47 was only an acceptance that Muslim majority areas could form their own separate independent governments. It was not an agreement that this was a Muslim nation and this was a Hindu nation, so migration ka sawal hi nahi tha. Lekin ye kaha ja sakta hai ki agar Punjab mein, if people were anticipating difficulties, then they could have arranged a movement of population in Punjab, limited to Punjab, or say in, in Bengal. But what was the problem in, you know, you can agree on migration or transfer of population if you agree on a dividing line. If you don't have a dividing, so there was no agreement. Uh, 
the, the Sikhs and Hindus who wanted the partition of Punjab wanted a dividing line much to the west. The Muslim League wanted a dividing line close to Delhi. So if you don't have a dividing line, how can you agree on a mutual transfer of population? Yes. Question is an uh, sir, Yeah. So we will take one last question. Uh, this is from Jyotir Maya Khatri. And his question is, why in Punjab, the six Muslims and Hindus who shared similar folk culture, language and shared values developed and harbored the idea of communism and believed in the separate nations for Muslims and Hindus? Um, yeah, I think one, one uh, reason has already been, <coughs> if the Hindus and Sikhs of Punjab had agreed that yes, let there be some kind of representation of Muslims in schools and colleges or government service. Uh, then maybe uh, it could have been avoided. Punjabis, you're, she's the person asked questions quite right. There was a common culture, uh, but then there was also resistance. Many educated Hindus and Sikhs said, "No, no, we hum apne bal pe aaye hain. Hum kyon inko reservation de?" So that also, also, so in the end, you may say it is a failure of leadership that people are not able to persuade others, failure to compromise. So thank you very much, sir, for this wonderful session and this post lecture discussion. It was truly enlightening and very insightful. And I think we all enjoyed this session and we got to learn so many things about the partition which is very useful in present times. Well, you're welcome, Ishan, and my blessings and greetings and good wishes to everyone. And I would love it if some people become serious scholars. Yes. Blessings. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay.